Assassin's Creed Valhalla's third major expansion, Dawn of Ragnarok, is available now. In Dawn of Ragnarok, Eivor must embrace their destiny as Odin. But how does Dawn of Ragnarok interpret and expand on the Norse myth it's based on? We got a Norse expert, Armin Jakobsen, to react to everything from the new Odin powers, to new characters, and even the brand new setting of Svartalheim coming in this expansion. Presented by Assassin's Creed Valhalla, Dawn of Ragnarok. I'm Armin Jakobsen, and I'm a professor at the University of Iceland in medieval Icelandic literature. I've been asked to look at some video clips from the game Dawn of Ragnarok, so I'm going to begin. You can see uh, Odin clearly, a rather young and vigorous version of Odin. He's often presented as an old man, but here he's quite young and vigorous and he seems to be collecting the dead from a battlefield. This is one of his roles, according to Snorarta, although it's said that the Valkyries do it for him, so we don't know if he actually does it himself. And here he has changed shape, which is also one of his attributes. The animals they change into are birds, for example, so we have narratives about that. Norse mythology is attested in post-pagan sources from the High Middle Ages, but Odin clearly had a function for a thousand years before that. So we don't know how accurate the representations are, but in these High Medieval sources he has become the main god, kind of a Zeus figure of the gods, so he's the father of the gods. He has noteworthy attributes such as the one eye, and this is how I immediately recognized him, and this is how he is always recognized in some of the sources. I kind of like this younger, vigorous Odin because many of the narratives about him do not suggest that he's particularly old and definitely not frail. Here we see various deities. There's one that looks very good looking, so that possibly Balder. We don't know his origins in the mythology. He's reminded scholars quite of Christ. And also his main function, function in the narrative is to die. People see a connection with Christ in that. And Balder is known to be the fairest god, a son of Odin, but he doesn't do much. He goes to hell, which is kind of a place who is descended from Loki himself. People who die natural death or accidental death go to her. And this is very clever of Loki, that he doesn't kill Balder himself. He gets somebody else to kill him who doesn't know what he's doing. Thus it's accidental, and thus he cannot go to Valhalla, but goes to Hell instead. They try to make a bargain with her to get him out, but that fails, and it's again Loki's machinations that ruin everything. Sustur has a role because he seems to storm the known world in the apocalypse and the old twilight of the gods. He's quite large in that picture, and possibly he is, but it is um, unclear, and all dimensions are extremely unclear in the Edda. They were not good at telling us the dimensions in that age. He's a nebulous figure, like he doesn't appear much in narratives, but mostly connected with the apocalypse, the Ragnarok. He's described as a, somebody made out of fire, so this portrayal of him is very close to the sources. He's one of the forces who destroy the world eventually. Uldar fell soon after Ivaldi did. Our mines and miners, any survivors now serve Glod. Is that name meant to mean anything to me? Glod is Sutar's bastard son, half Muspel, half Jotun. A nightmarish being, capable of tearing a dwarf in two. The dwarves are not very prominent in the uh, mythology, and they're not present in Icelandic folklore at all. So we have only like the Attic dwarfs and there are about seven dwarfish characters in the Etta and they have quite diverse roles. Some are carpenters. And this is something we often associate with dwarfs in our age and not least because of Tolkien and his influence. It's kind of hard to make generalizations about dwarfs given how few of them actually appear. There is another strain of dwarves that enters medieval Icelandic literature, and this is like the Romance strain, where dwarves have a clear function as supernatural helpers. And this is something that eventually we see in the fairy tales like Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. There are four dwarves that are said to hold the world up, so maybe 
they were quite significant. But here they're really threatened by this Claude Carter. You get a chance, you kill him. Giants in general, the Jatnar, they do have an important like foundation role. Like they're supposed to be old. And that of course means they are knowledgeable. They have some kind of relationship with power, which is interesting. It's easy to use fantasy here because the sources don't really say that much. Whether they're giants or not, it seems clear, but clearly they're terrifying figures and associated, of course, with Frost. Snorrida begins with a very strange description of fire and frost and how they somehow combine to make the world. You know, the elements in general are very threatening and they still are. I think there's an idea that anyone connected strongly with the frost is bound to be uh, like you should be aware, wary of them. Why wouldn't I remember my own Valkyries? It has been many ages since Odin, son of Bor, father of Thor, took his duty seriously. Instead, he frets about the future, tries to wriggle free of fate. That's what I hear. Yeah, this is fun. <laughs> Clearly this one is quite rebellious, but they're sort of connected with Odin. They're sort of his servants. Their main role is going to the battlefield, choosing the right warriors, Possibly they can fly. It's very natural to make them into fighters if that is done in this game. The relationship with war, with battle, is so is so clearly stated in all the sources. And yeah, I think it's possible that some of them might have been disruptive towards Odin. Death is very important and death is in, in a way kind of a start. The servants of Odin who go to his kingdom to keep on fighting. That's what they do, they keep on fighting. Whatever, it doesn't seem very glamorous to us. But clearly that was seen as a, a very good thing to be able to fight forever. Odin has a very strong connection with Ravens. The almost one of the first things that's mentioned about him is that he served by uh, two wolves and two ravens who give him tidings. Ravens are also mentioned very often in connection with battle in the Kennings. Dead warriors are referred to as food of the raven. The raven is clearly seen as a very important mythological being and in particular connected with Odin. Things that Odin represents, which is like death, battle, and possibly poetry because ravens are so popular in Kennings. Yeah, Odin is a raven god. He's called that. Like, that's one of the names for Odin is raven god. So I think it's good that he has the power of the raven in this game. A lot of the facts that are presented in the Snorretta are about, like, night and day, sun, moon, wind, all the elements. So they're clearly very interested in elements and there's a strong tendency to connect the gods with the elements. The dead are seen as, as very uh, hard to control and e even in the law codes of Nor Norway and Iceland it's spoken about resurrecting the dead as a particularly dangerous thing to do. Yeah, there is a, a whole sarcasm scene where the dead seem to be fighting with the sorcerers there seems to be a great fear of, of, of like fiddling too much with death. The undead of Iceland are almost like the vampires in Eastern Europe, in that they can be very hostile and they can attack you physically. So, so there's reason to be uh, scared of them. I've read a lot of the shape-shifting narratives and written about them, and it's so unclear what it is. Like, what is shape-shifting? Do you turn into an actual animal? Or what do you do? Like, is it the mind? Is it the body? There are whole texts where it's entirely unclear whether an actual transformation into an animal is taking place, or if it's only partial, or if the mind changes at all, or if it's just the body. Things are left vague intentionally. So I think like Odin as a shape-shifting god, I think this like depiction is very much in line with how medieval authors saw him as somebody who would like always in in fact be kind of disguised if we regard him as god then he clearly is like representing the elements and we have like also a family of snow people like king snow and his daughter who's called Mjot, which means light snow john snow is not the first snow in, in european culture 
So I think that that's something that exists. Like, what are these people? Like giants, gods, that's often left quite vague. Yeah, this is an art gate, and it's most impressive. There is a famous art gate in Njalsara, and this is possessed by Gunnar of Lidarenta. It's supposed to have been something like that. That's like a, a mixture of weapons. Gunnar killed the previous owner, who was a Viking, and took the art gate from him, and uses it extremely efficiently in battle. He did have a spear called Gungnir, but I don't remember him ever wielding it. I think it's within the mythology. The dwarves are supposed to live in the Svartalvaheimur. Svartalvur means, though, Black Elf. Among the dwarf names of Snorri, there are several that are actually elf. A dwarf can be called an elf. So there seems to be no clear-cut distinction between the elves and the dwarves. Modern biology is full of classifications and categories of animals and beings where everyone is classified as one thing. But this is not necessarily the medieval mindset. So when a modern person goes back to the medieval era, they feel that whatever they meet must be either an elf or a dwarf, because we have two words and thus possibly species. The heathen religion existed in a very large area for a very long time, and it was never unified in the same way as Christianity eventually became. So that means it's possibly a fallacy to regard the pagan religion as any one thing. So you can very ima easily imagine that there are several beliefs about everything. I liked Odin. I felt he was quite interesting. The dwarves are possibly a bit traditional, like there's these traditions in dwarves and giants. They're not necessarily how they were visualized in the medieval ages. They're more like a, something that has become traditional through the ages. I thought the landscape was good. It reminded me a bit of Iceland. The green color reminded me a bit of Iceland. On the whole, I thought the imagery was quite impressive. That being said, I haven't really been playing computer games much. So, like, I remember the 80s computer games, and they've certainly evolved quite a lot. All of us are very happy for Old Norse being a part of this. And also, I think it's good to, in some way, go back to the medieval sources, because, like, Marvel has done its own thing with, the, with it, and that's not necessarily how things are in the older sources. I don't regard the any medieval source as the truth about these gods. Like, they are full of contradictions, even within the same source. There's no picture, and I don't think we even should look for it, like the truth about how uh, the pagan religion was, because I think it always was, you know, quite diverse. Its region had its own version of this, and Odin, things like Odin were extremely, they traveled widely, so there must have been several Odins, I guess. Assassin's Creed Valhalla Dawn of Ragnarok is available now on Xbox Series X and S, Xbox One, PlayStation 5, PlayStation 4, PC, Stadia, and Luna. For more experts reacting to cool stuff, keep it right here on IGN.